we're still talking about discipleship and and uh, we have a, a discipling kind of story today, but it, it also features a father. And there's a lot of stories, a lot of father stories in the Gospels. Uh, beginning with the story of Joseph, who became a dad in a remarkable way to a rather remarkable child. And Jesus often uses fathers as an example when he's trying to make a point in, in Luke chapter. 11 he said which of you fathers if your son asks for a fish will give him a snake instead and as I was thinking this morning every time that we find a father encountering Jesus in the gospels it's on behalf of his child it's out of his deep concern for his children that he approaches Jesus and there are a number of these kinds of accounts in in the scriptures when Jesus is dealing with a father who's in crisis because their child is suffering. Their child is sick or, or lame or dying or possessed or dead. And there's a story recorded by Mark, and he shares an incident when Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, they're making their way down off this particular mountain where something rather extraordinary has happened. And that's another story for another day. But the four of them are making their way down this mountain and they arrive at this rendezvous point where they're to meet the other nine disciples and, and kind of keep on doing what they're doing. But they find that the other nine disciples have a large crowd gathered around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So imagine these four guys, they've been on top of a mountain, something extraordinary has happened, they're emotionally exhausted. Their adrenaline is still pumping through their bodies. They're down the mountain and they walk into an argument. It's exactly how you want to end the day, isn't it? It's, it, it's really not. And Mark wrote, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. So Jesus, who's been up on this mountain, had this this transfiguring experience comes down and here comes the crowd there's no avoiding it and he looks at his disciples and he says what are you arguing with them about kind of a, now what's the problem and what beef does this group of people have to do with with us now and here's the issue Earlier, when Jesus would send his disciples out to do ministry, they'd done well. They'd done really well. There'd been miraculous healings. There'd been the casting out of demons. In Mark chapter 6, just the previous chapter, Mark wrote, they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. What they were doing while Jesus and the other three were up on the mountain was, was continuing on with ministry, just as they had done, just as they'd been successful at. But today, at a critical moment in their ministry, it's just not clicking. It's not happening. The things that used to come so easily are now up against a brick wall. And the crowd is angry. Uh, this isn't what they'd come out to see. First, they'd, they'd come out to see Jesus. And he's not there. He's on a mountain. And if they can't see Jesus in person, they at least expect to see some miracles or, or th they're here to see some kind of action, something miraculous. And the teachers, of course, well, they're just doing what they always do. They stand at the fringes and watch and observe. But today... The teachers are using this opportunity to point out the failings of the disciples. That's why they were there, to turn the crowd back toward their direction. They want to discredit Jesus and his followers. They want to raise their own standing in the community and in the eyes of the crowd. And this is the source of the chaos and in the midst of the arguing, in a voice that somehow is heard above the arguing, a father speaks up. 
And he said, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit. And then the dad lists his son's symptoms. He says, possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. And I think it means that at, at one point my, my son could talk. He could communicate with us, but, but it's been robbed. He can't speak anymore. And that's not all. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Now, it's one thing to deal with a child that has a disability. You can kind of manage that. If my child can't speak, we find ways around that. We find a way to communicate. But this other stuff, these other terrors that are inflicting this child, they come and go. You never know when it's going to happen. Can you imagine your son or your little girl never knowing when they're going to be seized by evil, taken by force. It could come while you're home. It could come while you're out. You never know. You live on pins and needles. Your senses are always on high alert. As a parent when our children have been sick. I learned this early on. When our children are sick, it's a whole different kind of terror, isn't it? When your child is sick, when your grandchild is sick, it's a whole different realm of fear. And I can't imagine what it was like to have a demon seize your baby, your little one, and then to never know when the next attack is going to come. This father said, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. A little bit ago, they could. They'd been seeing success. It had been relatively easy, maybe in their minds. Why couldn't they this time? When Jesus sends them out, he sends them with his authority to do his ministry among the people. But in, in some sense, these nine are still unconvinced that they can do it. It's a reality check. It was going to come sooner or it was going to come later. But it, it was going to happen. Number one, the the disciples find that what used to be so simple to them is now much more complex. It's much harder than they expected. The second, crowds that used to praise God when Jesus would show up and heal people are now arguing with them. They're questioning them. They're not praising God in this moment as they expected. They're complaining. And third, these teachers of the law that used to just be satisfied standing at the fringes and whispering to one another, well, now they're they're engaged in challenging them and pointing out their failings and starting arguments. And what's become clear that in this moment, dealing with this spirit in this child, And with these people in this crowd, that even though the disciples do believe in the ability that that Jesus gave them to be able to carry on the work, you know, they've seen and experienced and done some, some incredible things, their trust in Jesus is still in its infancy. They believe. But there are still shadows of doubt that haunt them. And when they are challenged, either by a stubborn demon or by a crowd or by teachers, they go back to their old ways, fear, confusion, cowardice. 
until this moment, it had been easy to follow Jesus. But from now on, it's going to get very, very hard. Not just in this moment, but because this moment leads to the next moment, and eventually it leads to the cross. You know, sometimes people assume that that the first few years of following Jesus are the hardest. But often they're not. Because the longer that you walk with Christ, the more complex, the more challenging work he is going to put in your lap. The more difficult issues you will face, the more strain on relationships sometimes. Yes, it does get easier in one sense, but as it gets easier, it also becomes more difficult. Because he's raising us up to higher levels of ministry and effectiveness in building his kingdom. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. This must have been just as frustrating for the disciples as it was for this father. And in this moment, and with this statement, Christ, I asked them to, but they couldn't. Imagine the shaken confidence of these disciples. They knew that Jesus had sent them out with his authority, and they weren't able to do the job. And Jesus sees that their confidence is shaken. The crowd, you know, they're just, they're just satisfied complaining. I mean, they were there really to just set, kind of satisfy their curiosity and see the show. And, of course, they want to see this little guy who's affected and seized by a demon. They, they want to see him restored and, and brought back to life, but it's not their child. The teachers of the law are there simply to, to challenge him because he's a threat to their power. But the truth is, if, if the disciples cannot deal with a faithless crowd, if they fear the mocking of the religious elites, and if they can't deal with the evil spirit, why can't they? They've been given authority. They ought to be able to do this. See, they believe, but they don't fully believe. And Jesus is kind of fed up. And with what are likely the harshest words that he ever speaks to his disciples, he says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? And he said, Bring the boy to me. So he says to the nine, you have been with me. I have called you. You are following. We have walked together. You have seen what I have done. You have done it yourself. What is the problem here? Why do you not fully believe? What's standing in the way? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit that had been tormenting the child saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. Evil took out its fury against Jesus on a child. An innocent child. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth, just as his father had described the symptoms. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. Then he says, but we've seen worse. It has often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. And you can't fault this father for the next words. Because we all have this place in our heart. We all have a place that exists in our soul that lies somewhere in the gap between our doubt and our hope. 
the tremendous weight of our doubt and the tremendous hope. Somewhere in the middle come these words. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. We've been there as a family. You've been there as a family. When things look so desperate, yet you have so much hope. Certain things, certain thoughts, certain prayers come out of that gap and that tension between doubt and hope. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus, by now, I I suspect he was ready to implode. He says, if you can... It's hinged on that statement, you unbelieving generation. Why would you doubt? If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. Who's Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to the the Father, of course. But who else needs to hear this? Every one of the disciples need to hear this. Every person in the crowd needs to hear this. Every one of those teachers standing at the fringe and observing needs to hear this. You and me need to hear this. Everything is possible for one who believes. Are you hearing me? Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. And you know the second part. Help me overcome my unbelief. How can those things coexist? I enjoy watching the documentaries of men and women who climb Mount Everest. How it it takes such strength, endurance, patience, determination, courage, just to make it to base camp at 17,000 feet and then acclimatize, then to slowly start this ascent up the mountain. But I've got this great fascination with these, these indigenous people called Sherpas. Incredible people. They're mountain people who prepare the route for climbers who are going to come later in the season. And part of their job is to prepare the route for the climbers, which includes setting up some pretty suspect devices in places that allow climbers to cross over the deepest crevasses on the ice flows. And what we have are a couple of Home Depot ladders that are strapped together at the center. And I found some pictures where they have five of these extension ladders lashed together over a crevasse. (laughs) Who said nope? Who has an amen for that nope right there? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, chicken? Who said chicken? <laughs> Can you imagine? And, and it doesn't matter. No, no, follow me. If you're standing here and you look across and you see dozens of other climbers who have been across that, does that make you all the more anxious to do it yourself? <laughs> imagine... Looking down at that. Oh, it gets better. Look at how they tied the knots. Doesn't that look safe? And look, there's a broken rung on this ladder. Not quite lined up.
It does not matter how many hundreds of people cross that ladder before you, does it? You will listen to their testimony about how brave they were and how they crossed. But when you stand at that edge, I believe, yet help my unbelief. I can't take this step. It's an honest statement, isn't it? Don't show me how many people have crossed because... This is me now. I trust you, God, but this is me. I believe you, God, but this is, this is my next step. So honest. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. That's interesting. The father never said anything about his child being deaf. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. The struggle of the nine disciples, we don't know about the other three that had come down the mountain with Jesus. The struggle of the nine and the father of this child and the crowd that's looking on and the skeptics that practice religious elitism and people like you and me is this. We have this form of belief and in some strange way, we are unwilling to let go of our unbelief. We have a belief, and we also have an unbelief. There's a part of my life, if I'm going to walk with Jesus, that I have to jettison, that I have to willingly let go of, and that's my right to not believe what he says. Think of all of the things, all of those destructive habits that you had, when you came to faith, and one by one, God kind of extracted you through the work of the Holy Spirit. These things no longer have a grip on you. Maybe unbelief is one of those things that we need to confess and deal with. Maybe unbelief is something that deserves to go on an altar and consumed by holy fire. And we come away with something more than just a form of belief, but the authentic, 100%, all-consuming belief that God is who he says he is, will do what he says he will do. Do you remember the old song that we used to sing? It was old when I learned it as a child. That's how old it is. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. This has never been about God's power being suspect, but about my belief being weak. I've got to give up my right to question God's ability and his authority over all things. You unbelieving generation. I do not want to live a life as part of an unbelieving generation. Do you? It gets us nowhere. Because then as we are challenged as we come into conflict with society, we are the ones who become fearful. And sometimes we become cowards. Certainly, we believe that God can carry us through the most difficult circumstances of our lives. 
We have to graduate to the point where we believe God will, not just can't, but will carry us through every difficult circumstance of life. Let's pray. I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Father, we need you. And we confess, Father, that sometimes we exhibit a form of belief that's fake, that's phony, that's thin, that can be moved, it can be shifted, it can be ignored. Father, we confess that we need a stronger sense of your presence, stronger sense of your peace. Father, we need to lay on an altar that spirit of unbelief that somehow continues to linger even after we've said yes to you, even after we know and you have shown us the power of your word of your spirit, after you have proven to us in our own lives that sin does not have to keep us in chains, but you have freed us from those things. What is it in us, Father, that that still questions? What part of me is still not quite convinced? And Father, help us to give you all May we surrender all, including unbelief, to you. May we cling to you. May we seek you in the morning. May we find you as we seek you. May we learn to walk in your way that is everlasting. We thank you, Father, for the table that is set before us. We thank you for the obedience of Jesus Christ. That after this event with this father and this boy, it continued taking him toward Jerusalem in that last week that ended in crucifixion. And the next week that began with resurrection. Thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the blessing to be your sons and daughters. Thank you that you are a good father. We pray for our own fathers today, that you would be near to them. Father, we thank you for the gift of memories that you have blessed us with as we think back about our lives and our fathers and how they impacted us and the funny things that they did the struggles that they had, and how you saw them through. Thank you for the privilege of being family. Thank you for your goodness. We pray this in your name. Amen.